It is cold outside, but I have this baby to keep me warm. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> ever since I made my video of the GR20 where I tell you my tips and my advice, I've been getting some messages from people who are asking me to make one about the Tour du Mont Blanc. So yesterday I sat down and I thought of all the things that you might be needing when you're planning to hike the Tour du Mont Blanc. And I came up with a lot of stuff actually, 14. I came up with 14 things that might be helpful when you're planning to do this trip. In this video, I won't be talking about gear since I already made a video um, about the gear I took with me on the Tour du Mont Blanc. So if you want to see that video, I'll link it somewhere in this video or in the description. Cool. The link is in the description, guys. The first thing I wanted to talk about is the starting point of the Tour du Mont Blanc. So the Tour du Mont Blanc is a loop trail, so a big circle that goes around the Mont Blanc. And it goes through France, Switzerland and Italy. And the trail passes through a lot of villages. So with a lot of villages come a lot of starting points. So there is one official starting point for the Tour du Mont Blanc and that is uh, Les Ouches. That's in France and there is like a, a thing where you can walk underneath that says Tour du Mont Blanc starting point or something like that. So in many guides this is the starting point. But in total I think there are eight points on the trail where you can start hiking because there's a road. So you have some popular ones, those are Les Ouches, Les Contamines, that's in France, you have Courmayeur in Italy and you have Champé in Switzerland. These are also great villages to like take a break, eat an ice cream, enjoy the view, you can take a swim in Champé, great. But there are also uh, some other points where you can start hiking the Tour du Mont Blanc and those points are I wrote them down. Argentière, Trion, Les Chapieux and La Folie. So you can start actually kind of wherever you want. I myself started in Les Ouches and I went clockwise, which is not the normal direction for the Tour du Mont Blanc. Uh, and ugh, that was hard. So the first thing I did on the Tour du Mont Blanc was the ascent of Le Brévent and that was, I think, a thousand five hundred meters of ascending mm, it was a lot so maybe 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 that's not the best starting point when you're going clockwise maybe so the second thing you might be thinking about is how to get to the trail so um it depends on where you start of course most people go to chamonix uh, that's a, a little little village that is inside the loop of the Tour du Mont Blanc. I went to Chamonix and I took the train from Brussels to Lyon and from Lyon I took a blabla car. It's a thing in France, actually a lot of people do it. It's an application you can uh, have on your phone. So in the application you just say I want to go from Lyon to Chamonix and then it searches for other people who uh, are going with their own car from Lyon to Chamonix. People do it in France and it's actually really nice. So you might consider that. Another thing people do quite a lot is take a train to Chamonix or to Les Ouches, that's also possible. Another option might be to take a plane to Genève or to Sion. Sion is in Switzerland. But I would say if you live in Europe, especially if you live in Belgium or the Netherlands or Germany, France, please consider to take a train. The trail is really accessible by train and you know it's good for the environment. The third thing I want to talk about is a tip and that is to take your time to get used to the oxygen levels on the trail. I didn't really do that. I just arrived at the trail and I started hiking and it really felt weird because I was hiking and I was maybe going up, well not so much, but a little and after like five to ten steps 
I was <sighs> really, it was weird. And then someone told me, maybe it's because you're not used to the oxygen levels here. And then I thought, hmm, that's possible. So if you have the time, just maybe first take a few days in Chamonix so that your body can just like adjust to the oxygen levels there. And then you'll probably have a better experience on your first days. The fourth tip is for people who are using this specific guide. So this is the Cicerone uh, Tour du Mont Blanc tracking guide. It's okay, it's not the best. It's quite heavy because it describes the route in a clockwise direction and in an anti-clockwise direction, which makes it really heavy because from like here on, this, all this is another direction. If I would make a guide, I would just include one direction. <laughs> yeah, one direction. Um, <laughs> I would just include one direction and then just let people read that direction backwards. But this is just weight that's not really necessary, in my opinion. But that's not what I wanted to say. So if you use this guide, make sure that you add some time to the estimated time of each stage. So for example, here we have stage eight and it says that it's like a four and a half hours to five hour hike. That's not true. <laughs> that is not true. I would say add at least one to two hours to each stage because really these times are fast. I felt quite bad on the first days of the of the trail because I thought am I this slow really how do people do this in like five hours or this in four hours and then I met some people who had the exact same guide and told me that they had the exact same problem so then I felt a little better so just add some hours to the estimated times of each stage in this book because they're like fast as hell. So the fifth thing I wanted to talk about is wild camping. I am a big fan of wild camping so everywhere where I'm allowed to wild camp I will do it. I don't like to sleep in huts because then you're just in a big room with a lot of people who snore. So yeah, wild camping, I'm a big fan of it. I will do it when it's possible. On the Tour du Mont Blanc it's a bit tricky to do this. In France Normally it's fine, you can wild camp wherever you want, but only if you put your tent up for one night. So you cannot just like arrive at 3 p.m. and put your tent up because then you're staying there for like an afternoon, that's not okay. But I mean mostly when you're doing a trail like this, you will just put up your tent for one night. So in France it's fine, France is okay. In Switzerland and Italy you are not allowed to wild camp. In Switzerland you have some campsites, so actually it's quite okay. I stayed at two campsites just when I was in Switzerland. But in Italy there is no option for like a campsite or putting your tent up next to the hut. It's not allowed and I don't really understand why because this is a really popular trail. So why just not make a campsite for people who want to put up their tent? But I don't know. So what I did in Italy was that I stayed in a hotel, <laughs> fancy fancy, <laughs> in uh, Courmayeur and I did one night of illegal camping. I came across a guide on the trail and he told me that just before I was going clockwise, so in my direction, just before the Rifugio di Bonatti, there was some kind of place with old ruins of a house and he told me that people wild camp there quite often. It's still not allowed, it's still very much illegal, but people do it. I hope this video doesn't get really famous because it's quite a secret spot. So I decided to go there and I just took a look around and there was a lot of garbage. So at that moment I quite understood why you cannot wild camp. In Italy. So if you decide to take this camp spot and to camp there to do some illegal wild camping, one, it's at your own risk. There could be 
police stopping by and giving you a fine. Mm? But two, if you do it, please just take five minutes of your time to pick up some garbage from the ground and drop it in the bins of Rifugio di Bonati. It's like a five minute walk from each other and just please just do it and leave no trace. I mean, please. Okay, the sixth thing uh, that you gotta keep in mind is that in Switzerland they use another currency than in France and Italy. So in France and Italy it's euros, but in Switzerland it's the Swiss franc. Be sure that you carry some amount of Swiss francs if you want to buy some stuff in Switzerland. Because if you want to pay with euros or a credit card, you um, mostly have to pay some extra amount because you're paying in euros so I'm um, just keep that in mind take other cash for Switzerland the seventh tip I have for you today is a tip that I also had about the GR20 and it's one of my favorite tips it is that you should try to leave early in the morning. The Tour du Mont Blanc is quite a popular trail and because of its many access points there are a lot of day hikers as well. If you are completely fine with people just ignore this tip but I like the solitude of a trail and I found out that if I left early in the morning I was quite alone on trail. You still pass a lot of people. It's a busy trail but it's better if you leave early then at least you have these first hours in the morning. The eighth thing you might want to know is the indications of the trail and how well the trail is indicated. So if you watched my video of the Tour du Mont Blanc, you might have seen that I got lost a couple of times. <laughs> the indications on trail are not so good and in each country they are different. In Switzerland they were actually quite okay but in France, it's as if people just went around like, oh, which color are we gonna use now? Ah, oh, we'll use red now. And uh, now, which color are we gonna use? Let's use some blue. Mm. So just to be sure, take a GPS and once in half an hour, take a look at it, just to check. Am I on the right path? Yeah, I'm on the right path. Let's keep on walking. The ninth thing I wanted to talk about is variants. So if this is the Tour du Mont Blanc, roughly, just a big circle, you sometimes have variants and those variants go in. So mostly that means going up a mountain and then back down. You have, I think, five or so variants that go in like this. And if you are in good shape and you're mentally all in a good state do the variant the variants are mostly prettier because you go up a mountain you have a really spectacular view you go down it's just it's more drama the variants are more drama if you like drama in nature and in mountains take the variants the tenth thing i want to talk about is really small it's just what you say to other hikers when you pass them in the three different countries. So in France and in Switzerland you say bonjour, it's just hello in French, bonjour. And in Italy you say ciao or buongiorno. I don't know if you have it as well, but sometimes I pass uh, English speaking people and they just keep saying good morning, hello, good afternoon, how are you? things like this and mm, I don't know why I don't know why but I find it quite a bit a peachy tiny bit ignorant to be on a trail in France or in Switzerland or Italy and just keep speaking your own language I'm not expecting you to be able to have a conversation in French but just just if you pass hikers say bonjour or in Italy ciao or buongiorno I don't know I don't know do other people have this as well or am I just being a difficult person let me know tell me if I'm a difficult person or not <laughs>
Okay, the 11th thing I want to talk about is temperature. Some people have been sending me questions regarding the thickness of their sleeping bag uh, that they should take on the Tour du Mont Blanc. I would say normally you won't be cold at night. I mean, yeah, you should take a sleeping bag, huh? but it's not freezing at night. I think the temperatures drop below 10 degrees Celsius, something around that, like 8 degrees, 9 degrees, 10 degrees. And during the day, temperatures rise to 30 degrees. I was there when there was a big heat wave in Europe. So in Belgium, it was around 35 degrees all day. And there on the Tour du Mont Blanc, it was like 20 to 25 degrees. And then the 12th thing, I just want to say it's really, really small. It's just a little, little, little thing. Between the summit of Le Brévent and La Flégère, there is no water. Just keep it in mind, take a little note, on your map or on your guide or anything. There's no water in between these two. That's the 12th thing. <laughs> then the 13th thing I want to say is that you don't need big, heavy, bulky hiking boots on this trail. It's just not necessary. The path is mostly just a nice path without too many rocks or stones or anything like that. So you don't need these big hiking boots. I took trail runners and mm, I don't think I will be switching back to big boots. They're lightweight and they are more comfortable in my opinion. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on or just I wanted to say to you is wear sunscreen. Wear sunscreen, really. Even if you are wearing long pants like yoga pants or long sleeve shirts, the sun is just more aggressive in the mountains. So just wear sunscreen. Don't forget it and don't think, oh, I never get burned. You probably will get burned. So yeah, these are all my tips for the Tour du Mont Blanc. If you have questions, as always, just leave them in the comments down below. I will try to answer them. If I don't answer your question, that's probably because I already answered it in a previous video or because maybe I will answer it in a next video. And then maybe, I, I never said this before in a video, but if you want, uh, you can subscribe <laughs> to my channel. <laughs> oh, this is such a sales talk. So if you want, just subscribe. I'm planning on making more videos. I try to make one every week, week and a half, two weeks. It depends on the weather because I always film outside. And uh, yeah, maybe give the video a, a thumbs up. They don't go unnoticed. No, 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 I see them. So uh, yeah, okay, uh, the sales talk is over. Thank you for watching. Enjoy your hike of the Tour du Mont Blanc. Really, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And I'll see you in the next video. Yeah, bye-bye. <laughs>